As we come into middle age, we all are driven into a funnel of narrowing possibilities. And around us, a mummy begins to grow. Nilon avoided the countless small deaths that waste away a loveless and uninspired life. and lived for real until the day he was killed. He understood that the essence of moral wisdom is to unprotect ourselves. And that we must be prudent in the small things. The better to be foolhardy in the big ones. Into this dark world comes redeeming love, unshaken, unsubdued, unterrified. It comes and it changes us. Although we would rather be ruined than changed. It is now 30 years and a month since I first met Nilan, a few steps away from the place where I am now standing. The uncanny thing about him was his shine from his eyes from his skin, enveloping me and going further and further out into the darkness around him and promising to last until we can see the others and hear their voices and find our hearts of stone turned into hearts of flesh. The next speaker is Clarence Diaz. It was as a teenager attending law school in Bombay that I first heard of Harvard Law School, and I'm not ashamed to say, by reading Eric Siegel's love story. <laughs> Today I want to talk about a love story. In Colombo, Upendra Bakshi moved us all very deeply when he described the moment both he and I first met Neelan and Siti 29 years ago, met a radiant Siti and an obviously smitten Neelan, whose life is one of the great love stories of all time. But I want to talk about another love story, the love story of Neelan and Harvard Law School. Neelan's passion has always been for the law, and so it is entirely natural that his love was Harvard Law School. A love possibly unrequited at the very beginning but requited today with an amplitude that almost surpasses understanding. Harvard Law School has given and continues to give a lot to Neelan, but equally, Neelan has given much and continues to give much to Harvard Law School. A few dubious detractors of Neelan callously chide and criticize him for his love for Harvard Law School as being born of pride, snobbery, and elitism. Little do they know the charming and disarming person that Neelan was. Neelan does belong to a select and rare elite, but
but it's an elite not only of ability but of meritocracy. Neelan, the connoisseur of excellence, excellence of the intellect, excellence of the heart, excellence of the soul. Acutely aware that it is but a single letter of the alphabet that separates the best from the rest, Neelan has dedicated his life in Colombo, elsewhere in Asia and at Harvard, providing opportunities to bring out the best in the young budding lawyers and jurists who were lucky enough to come in contact with him. From them, he would ask no more than their ability, but he would settle for no less. His challenge was never to let the good be the enemy of the best, but his compassion was also never to let the best be the enemy of the good. His view of legal education as a process of putting in and not merely one of drawing out. His view of education as a process of self-learning and self-fulfillment within a nurturing, caring and challenging environment is what caused him to strive to create the institutions he created which could provide that kind of nurturing, caring environment. Over 55 years, Neelan has constructed an intellectual legacy that will remain forever challenging. For me, that legacy is contained in just three concepts and three words, reimagining constitutionalism and diversity, especially cultural diversity and pluralism as a gift to be cherished and nurtured, not feared and repressed. So today, let us celebrate Neelan, a consummate crafter of consensus. Let us celebrate Neelan, the master of the uncompromised compromise. Let us celebrate Neelan, the warrior for peace, whose only weapons are truth, integrity, compassion, and nonviolence. Neelan's friend, Roberto, has referred to Neelan as a saint. I think Neelan, with his irrepressible sense of humor, would smile and endure my ending this tribute to him with the words of one who could never have been canonized and in fact was uncanonizable. Her words were words which for me really capture the reality that is Neelan. I burn my candle at both ends. It will not last the night. But ah, my foes and oh, my friends, it gives out such a lovely light. Thank you, Siti. Thank you, Mitran. Thank you, Nirgunan, for allowing me to be part of Neelan. I wish to say a few words myself about Neelan. We too met about three decades ago when he was a graduate student here and I a teacher. The two of us went to Yale together to spend a year. I as teacher, he as a fellow in its law and modernization program. We grew close then. We grew only closer over the decades, particularly when my own work turned very much toward human rights, particularly after the human rights program began, and all sorts of collaboration with Nilan and his work became possible. At times, it seemed almost inevitable. It has surprised me how vivid my recollections of Nilan are. The quizzical face turned slightly upward. The frown of concern and seriousness, the wryness and the laughter, the quiet humor in so much, the utter dedication and seriousness beneath. We saw each other not that frequently, perhaps five times over the last decade, but each meeting held its intense talks as if there were so much to be said and discussed and proposed in so short a period. It was a special treat when Sethi was there too, as in our garden in Cambridge.
in Cambridge a few years ago full of talk and laughter, including some of Sethi's many wry observations about her husband, such as his remarkable capacity to disappear completely into a sea of newspapers for endless hours. Our last meeting was in Geneva, during a time when UN groups and minorities and ethnic conflict were convening. Several younger people from his organization, ISIS, were there. Following Nemo, as he strode so briskly and purposively from the Hotel Montrepo to the Palais des Nations, his interns and students in tow, admiring and learning, led by the master doing the UN round. It was Nilan, the teacher and mentor at work, all in the cause of his passionate desire to achieve through discussion and understanding what bloodshed and terrorism could not. I felt a great fondness toward this man. I deeply enjoyed him, his quiet but persistent way of advancing his serious beliefs, his tact and politeness in advancing a direct proposal never demanding, always asking, do you think, Henry, when you speak with so-and-so, you could possibly say something about the ideas we've been talking about? I took that as command. It was such a good idea, but never put forth by him in that spirit. So gentle and considerate, but so persistent, patient, and firm, quiet but strong, full of a wiry energy. I never spoke with Nilan about the source of his rooted beliefs in the right paths toward peace and justice. Courageous he surely was, but there was more than raw courage. Surely his person and his work expressed not only a deep love for humankind, but a deep faith in human nature and our capacity for empathy and understanding in our ultimate goodwill. Was that faith in any sense a religious one, in a concrete sense? Or was it a less defined, spiritual sense of mission and hope that enabled him to continue in his path despite the evil that all saw about him? I now wish we had engaged in such a talk. It is strange, isn't it, that when someone admired by and beloved to us dies, the relationship doesn't end but takes on renewed force with a desire that we had known him better. Our service now turns to some music provided by Sethi, loved by Nilan. We shall hear it for about 10 minutes, and then anyone here is invited to rise and express thought about Nemo.
महादेव प्रभु मु सहज कारुण्य वीक्षण सहज कारुण 